Hello, my name is Miguel and I am a Chagas researcher at the Forestry Development Department. My work has a focus on ash trees and ash dieback, an invasive disease that has put under threat ash all over Europe. I studied defense mechanisms in ash and different aspects of its interaction with the agent that causes ash dieback disease. Today, I will talk about my work and present some of the results that research carried out at Chagask has produced in the last years. Today's presentation is called New Findings in Ash Dieback Research by Chagask. And in this presentation, I will talk about first an introduction uh, which is called Ash in Distress and will deal with why ash trees are in distress at the moment in Ireland and in many other places in Europe. Um, then I will talk, as I said before, about three different studies carried out at Chagask. The first one uh, will deal with what makes an ash tree tolerant to ash dieback. Some trees do not get infected by, the, by ash dieback. And then we want to know what components do these trees have that other trees don't, that make them uh, able to resist the infection of the disease. Um, the second study uh, will focus on the role of lenticels. Lenticels are small uh, pores in the bark of woody plants that allow gas exchange, and how they, these pores can be a shortcut for infection of ash dieback in ash trees. And then in the last study, we will try to answer to a question, which is, is Irish ash ready for the future climate? And to this, we will look at the performance in terms of growth of different European ash origins in Ireland. Ash dieback is an invasive disease, and its causal agent is called Hymenoscyphus praxineus, and it's a fungus. The fungus originates from Eastern Asia, and in its native environment, it degrades ash leaves once they are on the forest soil, and it contributes to recycling the organic matter in forest soils. And in Europe, we have a very similar fungus called Hymenoscyphus albidus, which does the same thing. When the ash leaves fall on the, on the, on the soil, this fungus will basically colonize them and make them look black. And uh, then in the summer, um, it will produce these small white mushrooms on the ash leaves. And that's what their life cycle. They are both specialists and they are natural decomposers of ash leaves in their native environments. What happens is that when one of them, Hymenoscyphus fraxinius, is brought into an evil environment, uh, then it's able to infect uh, ash trees there. Um, that's what's it's called an invasive pathogen. Um, and this is the story about an invasive nut pathogen meeting a naive host. Um, here we have two maps. On the left, we have a, a map of Europe, and on the right, we have a map of Eastern Asia. And before the 90s, uh, Hymenoscyphus fraxinus was only found in Eastern Asia, uh, and uh, Hymenoscyphus albidus was found in Europe. And sometime in the 90s, somewhere in Eastern Europe, um, this fungus is brought by accident from Asia into Europe, and then it meets a naive host. So their interaction is not anymore a uh, symbiotic interaction, uh, and it basically starts, uh, instead of feeding on the dead plants of the ash trees, like their leaves, it starts feeding on the living plants of the trees, causing an infection and ash dieback. Um, as time passes, uh, in the next decade, the disease spreads through most of Eastern and Central Europe, and also Northern Europe, and people start seeing how ash trees look sick. And in 2006, a Polish uh, researcher actually identifies that the cause of this ash trees looking sick is a, is a fungus, and uh, the disease is baptized at that time uh, as ash dieback, and people become more aware of it. Uh, in the next decade, the fungus keeps on spreading in Europe and affecting ash trees, and uh, by the end of this decade, uh, it has reached everywhere in Europe except for the most southwestern parts of it. Um, the story in Ireland is very, is very similar. In 2012, there's the first report of ash dieback, and the invasion of every county in Ireland happens in only six years. Uh, after, uh, in 2018, uh, ash dieback was found in every county in Ireland. And this puts under direct threat 25,000 hectares of ash forests and plantations in the country. And at the same time, uh, once ash trees are infected by ash dieback, their branches become, become weak and they can break and fall at any time, causing a, a, a threat to people around them, be it in next to roads, in forests, in parks, everywhere where there are ash trees, these ash trees, if they get infected, they can actually be a threat to people. Um, needless to say, this disease has had a huge impact on broadleaf forestry in Ireland. Before 2012, ash was one of the main broadleafs planted in Ireland. 
and this disease has removed ash from the possibilities of plants that can be planted in forestry in Ireland. So um, when the disease arrives to an ash forest or an ash plantation, what, what happens then? How do, how do trees die? And there is a very recent publication which looked at different studies where people have looked through the years after the disease is identified, how many trees die on a site. And if you put together all those data from all those studies, you get this graph here on the left, which shows that in the first two decades, mortality will reach a number around 60%, and then it will uh, stabilize there. So the answer is that in the first two decades, of the disease arriving to a new place, most ash trees die. And from those that don't die, what happens with them? Well, this other study shows us the health condition of ash trees in two different sites in Norway. Uh, the one on the left uh, shows the results for a um, site in the Atlantic part of Norway, and the one on the right shows the results for uh, a site in the continental part of Norway. And in both these sites, in every year, there is a, an assessment of trees, and they are given different health conditions, depending on if they are dead, they are marked in black. If they are completely healthy, they are marked in white. And then we have intermediate categories in the middle. What we can learn from these two uh, different uh, studies is that uh, up to a 30% of the trees after a number of years of ash time will look and remain healthy. And then there we have another part of the trees which is up to 50% which we will be 50 or 60% which will be um, dead or heavily damaged by the disease. And then we have a few of them that are in the middle. And why do we have more dead trees on one side, on one side than the other? Well, uh, the, the impact of the disease depends a lot on, on the climate conditions of the site. So humid sites tend to have a higher damage of ash dieback. And this would put Ireland closer to the scenario we see on the left than the one we see on the right, due to the climate in Ireland, which is humid and Atlantic. So talking about the first study, uh, from these trees that were marked white in the slide before, so what makes them tolerant? So what do these trees have that the others don't that makes them prevent infection of ash dieback? And for this study, we put bark samples of two groups of ash uh, trees. One group was uh, made by 20 tolerant plants, and these were trees which grew under, the, under ash dieback, under the effect of ash dieback for many years and showed no symptoms. And their neighbors around them were dying, but they through the years remained healthy and therefore they were classified as tolerant. The other group of samples were 20 trees, which were selected two years after the arrival of ash dieback to a site, and they were showing dramatic symptoms of the disease. They were, they were showing like uh, severe symptoms and they died soon after, uh, and therefore they were classified as susceptible to ash. So by comparing these two groups, we were hoping to learn what makes them different. And we did a metabolomics analysis, which is a full biochemical profile for each one of these samples, and then we put all of them together and compare them. And what we found is that they are up to, if we put them in the same graph here on the left, we have the blue samples, which are tolerant, and the red samples, which are susceptible. And we see that they do not mix. They actually belong to different clusters. And they are separate in the graph because they, there's a number of chemicals in them which differ, up to 63 that we identified. And it means that the susceptible group has a higher presence of some of these chemicals, 29 of them, Tolerant group has a higher presence of 34 of them. So being tolerant is not only having something that makes you tolerant, it's also not having other things that can make you susceptible. Among the candidates that we identified, we found two of them, uh, fraxidin and esculetin. They belong to the chemical family of uh, the coumarins, and they're highly abundant in ash. And they both show to inhibit the growth of uh, hymenoscyphus fraxinius, which is the fungus that causes ash, ash type. And here on the, on the, on the graph, we can see uh, two petri dishes where we grow the fungus, and they both have a blue circle, which indicates how much the fungus has grown after two weeks on the petri dish. So uh, the, the petri dish on top shows how much the fungus can grow in a medium with just sugars, so just normal growth of the fungus. And then the plate on the bottom shows what happens if we add these coumarins to the medium. So if we add the coumarins to the medium, we can see that the, if the fungus has grown much less and therefore, uh, these coumarins inhibit the growth. So a tree which has more of these coumarins will be able to resist better the disease. 
for our second study, um, we looked at different ways in which um, high mineral sky phosphoxenius can infect ash trees and cause ash dieback. And here we have a life cycle of the fungus. And we see how through the year it goes through different stages. Uh, towards the end of the spring and during the summer, the fungus produces these small mushrooms of fruiting bodies in the, in the forest soil. And then the spores from these fruiting bodies, they are uh, brought dis dispersed by the wind and they are brought up to the leaves. Uh, when, they when they hit the right spot, these spores will germinate and will start a small infection in the leaves, which will progressively become larger and advance into the tree. Uh, once the fungus has reached the bark or the stem, it will start causing what we call dieback, which is the major symptom of the disease. In some cases, under conditions of high humidity and high disease pressure, uh, healthy trees can actually die suddenly. And this is due sometimes to uh, the presence of collar or stem infections. And these infections are not connected to the leaves in any way. So they are healthy looking trees that suddenly die. And an infection has occurred at the base of the tree without having gone through the leaves. So the classical system in which the fungus infects the tree doesn't apply here. So if the fungus didn't infect the tree through the leaves, how could it do it? So our work tried to answer that question. And what we saw is that Lenticels, they are small cell pores that occur in the bark of woody plants. And we have a section of a Nash lenticel here in the image on the left. And we can see how uh, the bark splits. And then there is a small mass of uh, dark green cells, which are the lenticel. And they allow the gas to go from the inside of the plant to the outside and vice versa. And therefore allowing the plant to breathe. Um, and in our case, we saw that some ash shoots show lenticels which have a, a lesion around them. Here on the image on the right, we can see on the right side, there's an infected lenticel. So we, have, we see this white spot which has a brown coloration around it, which is the lesion starting to spread. And then we see two healthy lenticels which just look like normal white dots in the ash shoot. So we saw that the ash dieback fungus can actually successfully infect lenticels and spread from lenticels into the, bar, into the bark and the stem of the tree. And perhaps this is the way in which cholera infections and stem infections happen. For our third study, we considered that ash trees are long-lived organisms. They, the moment when they germinate from seeds, they need to be ready to live for centuries. They cannot move from where, from, from where they grow, which means that for the next uh, decades and centuries, they will have to face every condition under which they are under. And this means that they they need, when they, in the moment they are born, they need all the tools that they are going to need in the next few hundred years. And if this happens, they will um, produce uh, offspring for the next generation. The problem is that an, an average ash tree takes about 20 years to produce seed. And climate in the last two centuries, but especially in the last half a century, has changed dramatically. Temperatures have raised and climate has changed. And climate is changing faster than three generations. So this leads us to ask ourselves, is Irish ash well adapted to Ireland? Well, uh, to study this, we looked at two different uh, ash trials in Ireland. Uh, so they are in County Cork and County Roscommon, and they have 50 and 40 European provenances growing in them respectively. Uh, what we did was to measure the growth after 15 years to try to see the performance of the different provenances in the trials. Uh, the map here shows in red the different European provenances that were used for the study, and in blue the places where there are the trials. So for the two trials that there are in Ireland, we assumed that if the provenances that are planted there come from two north or two south, they will not grow optimally. And this will happen because if they are from two south, they might get frost damage because they flash too early in the spring, or if they are from two north, perhaps they don't use and optimize the growing season. So they bud flash, their bud flash occurs late in the season and their leaves and essence occurs early. And they have a shorter growing period, which makes, leads them to grow in less. So by, by comparing different provenances, if we have a gradient of latitudes, we will have um, a curve which will show us an optimal growth. So, and we can estimate this optimum. Uh, for the trials we did this, we measure the growth for every provenance, and then we compare the growth to different provenances. What we saw is that for each of the two trials, the latitude associated with the maximum growth was below the latitude of the trial sites. 
in particular, and as I mean, it was 3.8 degrees more south than what the trial was standing. This means basically that um, the best performing provenances in the CORP trial were the ones from northern France and Belgium, and for Roscommon, the best performing provenances were those coming from southern England. So these results uh, make us wonder a few things. Among them, uh, are our native forest genetic resources up to date in terms of climate adaptation? So if we plant Irish ash in Ireland, will it be optimally, optimally adapted to the climate in Ireland? And then the next question is that the climate is likely to continue changing in the next decades. So if our native forest genetic resources are not, are not optimally adapted at the moment, they will, they will be less so in the coming decades. And finally, uh, we would have to consider um, within our breeding, ash breeding program, uh, which offers us a chance to start over, if we want to include material, partly at least from, from provenances which are more southern from Ireland, to make sure that they will have the genetic components that will allow the offspring to adapt to the future climate in Ireland. That's all I want to talk about today. Thank you for your attention, and I would also like to thank uh, the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine for their support to our research, and the Max Black Institute for uh, carrying out the biochemical analysis of our work samples. Thanks. Well, that was the presentation. Thank you for watching, and I hope that you have learned a few new things today. If you have questions, contact forestry at chakask.ie.